The FDA's decision to approve a new drug to fight Alzheimer's is revolutionary to some, controversial to others, but how does it impact the Alzheimer's community? Well, let's find out by talking to Brooks Kenny. She is the executive director of Women Against Alzheimer's and also is involved in Us Against Alzheimer's. So, Kenny, Brooks, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Lee. So give me the uh, the big picture here. How important is this to the Alzheimer's community? This is revolutionary. You know, this is probably one of the most exciting moments in the Alzheimer's movement. Patients and families have been waiting for two decades to have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. This is the very first disease modifying therapy, which targets um, the earliest stages of the disease, really hopefully giving people uh, more years of quality of life uh, and, and reducing the symptoms. Uh, and we're just thrilled that the FDA has made this decision. So what do you say to those critics who are arguing, we don't know whether or not this drug is going to work. It's extremely expensive and there is an uncertain future for people who take it. Well, let's unpack that a little bit, right? So there, there's a bunch in there. So first, we have to remember that 6 million people are living with Alzheimer's disease today. And we know that they are suffering without treatment. And for so long, there has been no hope. So the fact that we have a first-in-class drug is really going to spur innovation and hopefully create more opportunities for additional treatments down the line with much more attention and research. The FDA is comprised of our country's very best scientists, and they have concluded that the drug does work and that the side effects can be managed. Obviously, continuous studies will be going on. Everyone is going to be watching it closely, and it really does come down to the patient and provider about what's best for treatment. With regard to cost, it's a huge concern. As a patient advocacy organization, we want this therapy to be available to everyone, to all communities. Let's face it, African-American, Latinos, and women are hardest hit by Alzheimer's disease. African-Americans are two to three times more likely to have the disease. Latinos, one and a half times more. Women make up two thirds of the caregivers. So this is a very important issue around cost, and we are committed to working um, with various partners to ensure that accessibility is not an issue. It has to be part of the conversation, and, and we're going to be joining that conversation. We already are this week, as, as we heard the news. So uh, there is something about this drug that I think people need to understand, and that is you won't know whether or not it's working for you for quite some time, right? I mean, if its, if it's, if it's mission is to prevent progress, of the disease, you won't really know whether or not your disease progression was affected by this drug or not. Well, I want to be very clear that I'm not a scientist, uh, nor a researcher or medical professional. Professional, I'm, a, I'm an advocate, first and foremost. But when we are talking to the researchers in our community, what we're learning is that patients will be very carefully monitored in this disease. And what we do in, with this treatment protocol, we do know that patients will be seeing their doctor on a regular basis and their progression will be documented. And so it's gonna really come down to the data. You know, what the problem with Alzheimer's is you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case. A lot of times people respond differently with or without treatment. So it's gonna have to really come down to a tight relationship with your provider to see how it's helping you. And, and really, you know, what we're hoping for here is for people to have a higher quality of life. One of the things about Alzheimer's that is often surprising to people is that 60% of cases go unrecognized. 60%. And when people do get diagnosed, they often get diagnosed late. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were talking about cancer and we were diagnosing patients stage three or four, the patient advocacy community would be up in arms, right? I mean, that would never be acceptable. So with Alzheimer's, one of the big reasons why we're so excited about this new therapy is it's gonna force us to have conversations earlier. So if people are getting treatment earlier, they're not only getting the treatment, but they're preparing their life. They're getting their financial affairs in order. They're getting their healthcare resources in order. Maybe they're identifying local resources that can help them as the disease progresses. And so there is a new day afoot where maybe people living with Alzheimer's can thrive and not just 
um, suffer. <laughs> so okay. I, you're right. I don't, I don't know if they can exactly tell how, you know, it's impacting them, but the earlier that we are getting therapy, the better we are. I mean, that's just common sense for quality of life. Yeah, and and to that point, um, you have a resource that I think is really important for people to know about. And let's start with mybrainguide.org. Early detection is so important. What role could, could mybrainguide.org play in that? Sure. Thanks for asking. Well, you know, at Us Against Alzheimer's, we knew uh, we needed to develop something of a resource to help people because millions are worrying about their brain health. In fact, 50, uh, for those 50 plus, it's the number one fear, cognitive decline. But we know a lot of folks don't necessarily know how to talk about it. They don't know how to talk about it in their families. And we certainly aren't talking about our memory in, with our providers right now, uh, based on market research. So we created this new platform called My Brain Guide. You can visit mybrainguide.org to access it, or you can call 855-BRAIN-411. And the platform includes memory questionnaires. You can take these questionnaires for yourself or on behalf of a loved one that you see often and you're worried about. It takes a little bit less than 10 minutes to complete. These questionnaires are based on validated assessments that exist in the clinical setting today, and we've just adapted them. So you can do it via a web bot or via the phone. And at the end of the experience, we provide you with tailored resources based on the answers you gave us. So we know that people and providers are overwhelmed when you Google you know, Alzheimer's disease and you have pages and pages of uh, notes from Google. That's not helpful, right? That's just mm -hmm. overwhelming people that's are, that are already overwhelmed. So with Brain Guide, you go through the memory questionnaire and maybe you do really well. And we give you tips on keeping your brain healthy, things that you need to be doing. Maybe you don't score as well on the questionnaire. And we talk to you about what screening, detection, and diagnosis could look like, how to raise the topic with your doctor or nurse. We also give you something that you can print and bring into the doctor's office. We learned from our interviews with patients and providers that having something in your hand when you go to the doctor gives you more courage to raise the topic. And it also gives the provider somewhere something to start with, right? Oh, wow, you didn't just Google, you know, something and, and bring me pages and pages. You actually went through a self um, assessment and this is the result of that. And so we're excited. We only launched at the end of March, the last week of March. We've already reached 150,000 people. We have had 70,000 people take the memory questionnaire mm -hmm. and we are just you know, just excited that this is a free resource. It's available in English and Spanish, completely translated, and we want it to be accessible to everyone. So it'll always be free, it'll always be private, and it can be accessed um, you know, from the internet or from your phone, a landline, and you can go through the experience that way. So we know that uh, there there is very little that you can do to predict your risk of Alzheimer's. Um, but there's much you can do to try and prevent it. Let's just take a few minutes and walk through what some of those steps are and the resources available to help guide us. Sure. Prevention and Alzheimer's, you know, those are magical words. <laughs> we talk about preventing heart disease and preventing cancer, but it's only as of late that we're really talking about prevention. And we at Us Against Alzheimer's believe in that. In fact, we're calling on um, the United States government to adopt a national prevention goal for Alzheimer's disease. And there are many, many studies out there now that are telling us about these opportunities for risk reduction. So your nutrition really matters. Reducing processed foods, focused on whole foods, leafy greens, omega-3s, very, very important. Exercise, rigorous exercise, six days a week if possible. Sleep, getting enough sleep. And I think that's one of the hardest ones. <laughs> I know it is for me, but getting enough sleep is critical because that's where your brain, your brain is kind of recovering from the day and it's really important. Learning new things, getting those brain synapses firing. If you don't have a, you know, if you don't have a second language, learning a second language or perhaps learning a musical instrument or just doing things differently that challenge you um, is very important. Reducing stress. Stress is a killer. It's just, it's just not good for us for any of our health, right? And so, uh, you know, there is good stress, but knowing how to manage your stress, adopting things like mindfulness or deep breathing. I often tell people, you know, don't beat yourself up or cause more stress if you're not 
currently meditating, but even if you just take a break every day um, is really important and just quiet the mind making sure you're not isolated socially, which is a big deal in the pandemic, right? We really need to be sure that we're thinking about ways to connect with uh, family and friends so that we're um, not isolated. And then certainly looking at chronic conditions. If you have hypertension, if you have depression, if you have diabetes, those are all risk factors for cognitive decline. And so we encourage people to be thinking about their brain health as they do their heart health and to really bring those conversations to their providers so that they can be um, managing it, um, you know, much earlier than, you know, your 60s, 70s or 80s, but even earlier in your 30s and 40s, we should be thinking about our brain health. I know when I feed my kids salmon and leafy veggies, they're tired of me saying it, but I say, you know, this is good for your brain health <laughs> or they get a good night's sleep. I'm trying to rem remind them this is good for their brain because it's something that we don't think about as often as we do other parts of our body, but it really is a vital organ and needs to stay top of mind. Oh my goodness, that is so true. Uh, you know, I would like you, if you would please, take a moment and drop the big scary bomb on us about what's ahead if we don't do something. The aging baby boom, that pig in the python, all of us in the peak years of, of baby boomers are aging into the Alzheimer's years. What could we face in this country if we don't get our hands around this? That's such an important question, Lee. And I will tell you, it, it, is, it is a scary um, future <laughs> if we don't address this disease. I mean, as I said, 6 million people are living with it today. We do not have enough neurologists in our country. There are many states without neurologists. We have a primary care system that is not set up to support people with brain health issues or cognitive decline. Most primary care providers are not trained in, in this topic. And so we are very far behind. They're not incentivized to spend the time on this topic, which is an issue and a problem. Our country continues to age, right? And while age, while Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging, age is the number one risk factor for the disease. By 2030, 40% of all cases of Alzheimer's will be a Latino or Black community member. So that is astounding if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have the infrastructure set up to care for all of these people. We don't have enough family caregivers as it is. There are 13 million caring for people living with the disease. And I can tell you from personal experience, it is a long road. And it is it not is. the same caregiving experience as other chronic diseases. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, and it is it is gloomy to think about it that way, but I'm very, very inspired as we all are at Us Against Alzheimer's that this new therapy is gonna be made available to patients in the next weeks, because we know that this is gonna get the conversation going. Conversations like I'm having with you are so important because we want people to start looking at this disease. We want people living with the disease to be detected early and, and we want them to thrive and we want to hear from them just like we hear from people living with breast cancer, or people living with heart disease. It's time we bring Alzheimer's out of the shadows. And we're really excited to be part of the movement and, and to be driving those conversations. Well, thanks for helping us do that here today. That is Brooks Kenny, Executive Director of Women Against Alzheimer's and also one of the organizers of mybrainguide.org. Thanks again. Thank you for having me.